For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about the preoperative valuation of cochlear implants. And I want to acknowledge the following individuals that have provided content for this lecture. These are Varsha Joshi from India, Anastasia Chian from Bali, and um, Koi, I call her Koi Patarak from um, Thailand. So definitely an international group that has allowed me to put this together. I could not do it without their help. <clears throat> when we look at the pre-cochlear uh, evaluation, specifically involving the temporal bone and the brain and other imaging um, and modalities to try to help assess cochlear implants, the approach that I take is that, first of all, we have to understand exactly what a cochlear implant is and how uh, a, the area or the path the electrode takes. So the electrode is inserted below the scalp surface or below the scalp, but then inserts through the temporal bone, it then goes in the middle ear and then eventually winds its way around the cochlea. So the implant is actually performed by the various neurotologists. So in radiology, we're very fortunate because we literally have the ability to look inside the brain and inside the skull base. But our surgeons, especially when they're performing this implants, don't have the ability to do that. So what I wanted to do was give you a sense of exactly how this is performed. And I want to acknowledge um, this website for this um, lovely illustration. <clears throat> so the first thing that's performed is that the pinna is moved anteriorly and there's a post-auricular incision as is performed here. So that is the post-auricular excision. They peel back the scalp and now you can see the underlying bone. Well, what the surgeons then do is that they start to drill into the mastoid air cells and they perform a mastoidectomy. So what this illustrates now is the mastoid to be being performed and we can see these various air cells. So first of all, it's really important that when we do evaluate this area, we talk about aeration of the mastoid air cells. And we'll specifically see this when we talk about some of the things that we need to include in our report. So the surgeons continue to drill down and you can see them drilling through the, the mastoid air cells. And eventually what's deep to the mastoid air cells will have to be the middle ear cavity. So here, what we can see is the surgeons have drilled into the middle ear cavity. And this area here is the epi epitympanum and more inferiorly is the area of the middle ear cavity. This little bone right here is referred to as the incus buttress. And we'll see the incus buttress later when we start talking about cross-sectional imaging. The area in red here identifies the location of the semicircular canals. We can see the brain, which is above the level of the tegment tympani, and then we can see the sigmoid sinus. And certainly, as we'll see, the uh, surgeons don't want to get into brain, especially the ENT surgeons, I could say, through this approach, don't want to get in the brain. And they also don't want to damage the sigmoid, sigmoid sinus. There is the corda tympani branch, and there's a location of the facial nerve. And again, this is the approach that the surgeon sees. <clears throat> we will specifically need to evaluate this when we start talking about our cross-sectional imaging. <clears throat> there are the ossicles of the middle ear cavity. We're going to zoom in on this. This is the level of the epitympanum. So at this level, it's the maneuvering the malleus and the short process of the incus. So that is the approach that the surgeons takes. So now that you understand that they start from the outside, eventually work their way inside, and eventually the electrical activity in the cochlea is eventually transmitted into the brain, this gives us a pretty good sense of some of the things that we need to include when we're performing our um, imaging studies and also in our reports. So the first thing that we have to talk about is the mastoid aeration. So the first thing that we said before is the surgeons make their um, skin incision and then they have to drill through the mastoid air cells. So from their standpoint, they need to understand whether or not the mastoid um, bone is developed the amount of aeration, because something like this is gonna be easy to drill through. They need to be aware of whether there's mucosal thickening involved in the mastoid air cell. And then if something like this, they certainly need to be aware of, this is an unaerated or sometimes called a cue ball. I used to call it ivory, but my neurotologists say that they refer to this as a cue ball air cell. So the first thing we have to talk about is the mastoid air cells. We also, when we were going through this diagram, looked at the sigmoid sinus. So as the surgeons are coming outside and drilling inside, they don't have the ability to know whether or not there are any vascular anomalies. And the last thing that they want to do 
is drilled into a vascular structure. So this is an example of an anomalous sigmoid sinus. This needs to be commented on in our report. And if there are any emissary veins that are located just below the cortex of the mastoid air cells, this needs to be commented on as well, because as you can see, they're coming from the outside in, and we have the ability to better evaluate these various structures. The next area that the surgeons look at is, as I mentioned before, once they've been through the mastoid air cells, they now get a chance to look at the middle ear cavity and the uh, and the epitympanum and specifically the um, mesotympanum. So this is their view when they look in the epitympanum. This is the manubrium, the malleus, and the short process, the incus. On the top right-hand corner, we can see the space surrounding this is the fossa incutus. So this is a view that we're seeing here at the bottom left-hand side, the space that's surrounding the manubrium, the malleus, and the short process, the incus, is the fossa incutus. So this is what they see. Now, just below this is a bony strut right here. This is referred to as the incus buttress. So this is the incus buttress. On axial images, it can be seen. If you look at the short process of the incus here, this little strip right here is referred to as the incus buttress. And if this is anomalous or very, very large, this should be commented. It's not really found in our radiology textbooks, but the surgeons know about this um, um, uh, very commonly. And right below this is the uh, entrance of the middle ear cavity. Now, sometimes the surgeons will go ahead and drill down the incus buttress so there is a straight communication. But on the other hand, it, sometimes the incus buttress can be used to tether the electrode because eventually the electrode needs to go through this inferior portion here and enter the round window, um, either directly through the round window or through a co cocleostomy. So the things that we need to comment on, specifically look <coughs> at the fossa incutus, look at the aeration of the middle ear cavity, look at the integrity of those ossicles. When we're into the mesotympanum, we also wanna comment on the aeration. So on the left-hand side is a normal appearance of the middle ear cavity. This ossicle anteriorly is the maneuver in the malleus. The ossicle posteriorly is the lenticular process of the incus. Here's the anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes. And just superior to this will be the capitulum of the stapes. So this is a well aerated mastoid air cell. The middle image demonstrates a patient that has a, 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 an infection involved in the middle ear cavity. So this type of infection needs to be commented on. Certainly there's too much mucosal thickening and diffuse enhancement. And in this particular case, there was a cholesteatoma that involved the middle ear cavity and then extended up into the epitympanum. So these things need to be commented on in the report. The other things that need to be commented on in the mesotympanum, as we mentioned before, are other vascular anomalies. So this is an example of an aberrant carotid artery. This is an example of the hissenjugular bulb. And this is a persistent stapedial artery. And the persistent stapedial artery, we can see the soft tissue mass that's located right at the opening here of the oval window. And classically, it runs right between the two crura of the stapes. So again, as the surgeon is coming from outside in, there's no way for them to assess this. And it's really our job. And this is where we really add our value to talk about these various vascular anomalies. In the middle ear cavity, we also have to comment on the course of the facial nerve. So we should always comment on the course of the facial nerve. This is the normal appearance of the facial nerve. This is a parasagittal image of that facial nerve. Here's a normal appearance of the oval window, and this is the normal appearance of the round window. So we should comment on the location of the facial nerve. We should comment on whether or not the oval window is patent, and also whether the round window is patent because eventually the cochlea has to be inserted through the round window. And typically it's either done through a round window approach or a co cocleostomy. Eventually this electo needs to be inserted into this specific location. Basically there are three channels involved in the cochlea. This needs to be inserted into the scale of tympani. There's also a scale of vestibuli and a scale of media. But when you have the insertion of the cochlea, the, the electro, the, the proper insertion has to be through the scale of tympani. So in this image on the middle area, this was performed through a cocleostomy. This identifies the location of the insertion of the electrode, in this case, into the basal turn of the cochlea. Now, one thing that some of the surgeons talk about is as they're trying to insert this cochlea, there's a little bone right here, which is re referred to as the crista finestra. Again, it's not really well described in the radiology literature, but it is described 
in the literature, in the ENT literature. And this crestofenestra, if it's very prominent, should uh, be commented on because sometimes the surgeons have to take this down. So this is an intraoperative view here of the crista, of the oval window and, excuse me, the round window. And this is the crystofenestra here. It was hard to insert that electrode. So in this case, they took down the crystofenestra and it made it easier for the uh, otologist to insert those electrodes. The next thing that we need to do is talk about the inner ear and talk about various inner ear malformations. Now, the way that I look at the inner ear is that I use 10, really, I still use the old way, the Jackler classification that was described about 30, 40 years ago. I know this has re been replaced by the IP1, IP2, IP, IP3, and we'll talk about that as well. But in general, just from a pure understanding of inner ear malformations, I still use the classic Jackler classification. So the inner ear is formed by this structure here, which is the otic vesicle. If we have an arrest in development at this level, the otic vesicle never forms, and this results in the classic Michelle's anomaly. So this is the normal appearance of the inner ear here. Here's our cochlea, here's our vestibule. In the Michelle's anomaly, there is zero, there is no development at all of the inner ear. So this is a very rare malformation, but when you do see it, it certainly is, does have a classic appearance. If we have an arrest that happens just after the development of the otic vesicle, this is what's referred to as the common cavity malformation. So essentially, the common cavity malformation looks like a big blob or a big O. And when you look at the cross-sectional imaging, you can see that this really does look like the embryological otic vesicle. So in this particular case, we just see a round inner ear malformation. There's no de-differentiation whatsoever between a cochlea and a vestibule. And this is the classic common cavity. If you start to have some development of the cochlea, this is what has been referred to as cochlear hypoplasia. Now I've been in do, doing head and neck radiology for many, many years. I've seen many things called cochlear hypoplasia as I've been to various meetings and uh, various faculty. The way that I describe cochlear hypoplasia, and I just use it based on the embryology, is that once we get to this otic vesicle stage, we can start to see some development of the cochlear buds. So if you have some type of development of the cochlear buds in association with development of the vestibule, then this is what I refer to as cochlear hypoplasia. For a true common cavity malformation, I have to see just this round otic vesicle-like structure. I do not refer to this as a common cavity. This to me, I would refer to both as cochlear hypoplasia. This was a little bit earlier and this one was a little bit later. Here we can start to see a little bit more development of the cochlea and a little bit more development of the vestibule. As we move on, the very last stage is the true Mondini malformation. Now, the Mondini malformation has a specific definition. It's fusion of the apical and the middle turns with the normally formed basal turn. And this was from Shutnik's book years ago. And what you also see here is a dysplastic appearing modiolus. Now, sometimes the modiolus you cannot see, and sometimes you can see. Sometimes you can see a little bit of tethering here or a little bit of a septum, the interscalar that attaches to the outer portion of the um, apical and middle turn that tends to at times tether the cochlea. But a true Mondini malformation is fusion of the apical and the middle turns with a normally formed basilar turn. So here's our fusion of the apical and the middle turns, and this is our normally formed basilar turn. That is a true Mondini malformation. <clears throat> now, the other malformation that is associated with, if you will, a Mondini is this. This was the enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So when Mondini, if you ever went back and read his original article, it was actually written in Italian, but it has been translated several times. What he actually described was fusion of the apical and middle turns of the cochlea with a normally formed basilar turn, but the patient also had an enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So if you do see this enlarged vestibular aqueduct, always take a look at the modiolus because in the vast majority of times that I've seen this, enlarged vestibular aqueduct is typically associated with some type of anomaly involved in the modiolus. This is sometimes called modiolar deficiency, et cetera. If we were actually focusing on the cochlea of the vestibule, then we would call this a Mondini malformation. But the bottom line is, is that when Mondini described this, not only did he describe the fusion of the apical and the middle turns with a normally formed vestibule, but he also did describe the enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So it's important to understand that association. <clears throat> 
Now, about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the term um, incomplete cochlear partition was introduced. Um, the, w the way that I look at and the way, if you will, our otologists look at it is they look at this in a way as a predictive metric to determine um, whether or not a cochlear implant will be successful. So this is a uh, type one um, IP, IP1. Essentially, I sort of almost look at this as the cochlear hypoplasia, if you will, where you sort of start to have separation the cochlea and the vestibule. But this is the IP1 where there's really not the normally formed uh, turns. The IP2 has been described as uh, more of a classic Mondini malformation with fusion of the apical, the middle turns, and a normally formed basilar turn. Personally, um, I can, in general, I this is included in the Mundini. For me, this is not necessarily a true Mundini, but I guess most people think of it as a Mundini in general. They have the apical and the middle turns. It's, there still is a dysplastic modiolus, which is, which is fine to me, but that's referred to as the IP2. So in general, if you think of fusion of the apical and the middle turns and normally formed basilar turn, the classical Mundini, that's IP2. And the IP3 is this Christmas tree appearance. This is the X-linked um, hearing loss, um, and we used to call this Phelps syndrome. Peter Phelps was a, a very famous uh, British radiologist who I believe was also an ENT surgeon. Um, lore has it that he self-diagnosed himself with this IP3, uh, what we didn't call IP3, but X-linked hearing loss. And this has now been transitioned into IP3. And this has a typical appearance. Sometimes we'll call this the Christmas tree appearance. Um, indicating the um, morphology of this um, abnormality. Well, once we have defined the congenital malformations of the cochlea, we then have to figure out whether or not the surgeons can go ahead and place the electrode in the inner ear. Remember, the electrode has to be placed through the scale of tympani. And as I mentioned before in that first slide, they're trying to very um, elegantly take this electrode place it into the cochlea and then push it through the cochlea. And what they really want to know is whether or not once they get into the scale of tympani, are they able to advance the electrode? And one of the things that can prevent them from advancing the electrode is uh, if you have fibrosis obliteration. This is what's referred to as labyrinthitis ossificans. So here in this case, we have labyrinthitis ossificans obliterating the canals of the cochlea. This is the classical appearance from Shutnick's book, <clears throat> demonstrating what we refer to as labyrinthitis ossificans. And this is a CT scan demonstrating very advanced fibrosis obliteration of the cochlea and also of the vestibule. So this is advanced stage. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that has been described over time is that MR is much better than CT for identifying subtle areas of labyrinthitis ossificans. So here's a case of a normal appearance basal, basilar turn in the cochlea. I remember this case, they tried to advance the cochlea. And when they tried to advance it, they couldn't do it because there's a small little deposit of fibrosis obliteration here. So um, this really pretends that I think in, in many institutions right now, especially those that do a lot of cochlear implants, they are doing MRs prior to the cochlear implants. What can also be beneficial is which ear to implant. So in this case, we have a lot of fibrosis obliteration involved in the left ear, not as much in the right ear. So in this case, the right ear was implanted because the signal was, uh, was better and they were able to better advance this electrode where on the, on the patient's left ear, it would be really hard for them to advance the electrode. So it has been used in the past to determine which ear to place the electrode. <clears throat> the other things that we can do is that we once the electrode is placed, patients are at risk for potential gushers. So the way to think about a gusher is that if they place the electrode through the round window or they perform a cocleostomy, they have to make sure that there is no perilymph that's flowing outside of the surrounding insertion of the electrode. So they want to have this completely a stop. You don't want any leakage. So this is the normal appearance. I wanna call your attention to the cochlear canal at the base of the cochlea and also the modiolus. The modiolus, along with the various inner scalar septa, almost form a plug here for this cochlear canal. So once the cochleostomy is performed, um, this modiolus prevents really this CSF from flowing into the cochlea. However, if you are looking at inner ear malformations and you do not see a normal 
modiolus as is seen here in IP1. You can see there's direct communication here of the internal auditory canal with the base of the cochlea. If an electrode is placed, this patient is at risk for gusher and a fluid coming out of the insertion of the electrode. Similarly, in IP3, we can see that there's fluid here in direct communication with the base of the malform cochlea. Similarly, if they try to perform a cochlear, uh, cochleostomy here with an electrode, this patient was also at risk because this IA, the CSF is in continuity with the cochlea, and therefore any defect in the bones around the cochlea can lead to a gusher. Well, what we've talked about so far is that we talked about the insertion of the electrode, we talked about the anomalies involved in the mastoid air cells, we talked about aeration and vascular lesions, we talked about the middle ear cavity and whether or not um, there was any mucosal thickening involving the middle ear cavity, we talked about insertion of the electrode in various inner ear malformations, <clears throat> we talked about labyrinthitis ossificans. Now, eventually, because these studies are performed in patients with sensor neuron hearing loss, we have to determine whether or not that nerve is intact. So when you do perform a CT, as was done in this case, we can see that there's a malformed cochlea and a malformed vestibule. But in this case, the heavily T2 weighted image demonstrated a normal appearance of the cochlear nerve. So if you have a normal of appearance of a cochlear nerve, that's a good sign because the surgeons can still perform a cochlear implant and they may be able to still innervate and activate the cochlear nerve because we know it's there. So when we look at the sagittal images, this is um, posterior and this is anterior. So here is the facial nerve, here's the cochlear nerve, this is the superior vestibular nerve, this is the inferior vestibular nerve, and we can see that there's a normal cochlear nerve. In this particular case, on the left-hand side, the cochlear nerve is hypoplastic, and in this case, the nerve is completely a plastic, so there's no nerve whatsoever. So prior, the, the one hard thing to absolutely prevent performing <clears throat> a, a cochlear implant is the absence of that cochlear nerve. So you have to specifically look to see whether or not that cochlear nerve is present. Now, granted, there's in, in many institutions, they are getting MRs prior to this to determine the integrity of the facial nerve. Some places do not do it and they still rely on CT. So what are some tips that say, hey, you know, maybe we should go ahead and perform an MR if your institution just does CT? Well, one way to look at it is look at the internal auditory canal. So if you see stenosis of the internal auditory canal, that could be a tip off that there may be an anomaly of the cochlear nerve. So in this particular case, we have stenosis of the internal auditory canal. And when we look at the base of the cochlea, there is no cochlear canal whatsoever. So remember, you have to have that nerve extending from the cochlea to the brain. Otherwise, the, the cochlear implant just isn't going to work. So in this particular case, when we performed a high-resolution T2-weighted image, there was no cochlear canal, and therefore there was no cochlear nerve, and the cochlear nerve was um, absent. So this was a contraindication to performing the cochlear implant. Another example here, in this case, the cochlea looks pretty good, but when we look at the base of the cochlea, the cochlear canal is formed, but um, the canal is stenotic. So here we have a cochlear nerve canal stenosis, it's stenotic here, and then when we performed our MR scan, again, notice that stenosis. If you look very closely on the CT scan, maybe there's some high attenuation here. On the MR scan, this was a very, very dark and completely fibrotic, so there was no cochlear nerve at all again. So a couple of things, if your institution's not performing both of these, I personally think they should be, but if they're not, what are some ways to say, hey, we really should be getting an MR? look for internal auditory canal stenosis and look for stenosis at the base of the cochlea in the cochlear canal. If that's stenotic, then certainly recommend performing an MR. And finally, eventually, once the nerve gets into the brain stem, eventually the brain has to activate. So in this talk, these are all head and neck talks. So we tend to focus on the internal auditory canal and the temporal bone and so on and so forth. We have to remember that there's an accessory organ there that's referred to as the brain. So there's, there's the brain for me is an accessory organ. Uh, but eventually the, the electroactivity that goes from the cochlear nerve eventually has to activate the brain. 
So we always have to remember that once this cochlea, it comes into the medulla, eventually works its way up the dorsal midbrain and eventually activates various areas along this course, and especially the primary auditory cortex. So when you are performing um, and evaluating patients with um, for sensory hearing loss, we have to remember other causes of hearing loss that are outside the temporal bone. So remember patients that have various infections, torch infections can have hearing loss. Patients that have migration anomalies can hear, have hearing loss. Remember patients with multiple sclerosis can have hearing loss, especially as the defect is in the dorsal midbrain. And then especially in older patients, patients that have multiple infarcts, can, this can result in hearing loss as well too. So we don't wanna forget about intracranial abnormalities that are resulting in hearing loss. So in summary, what I've tried to do over the last 25 to 30 minutes is talk about our approach for precochlear implant evaluation. We want to, again, evaluate the mastoid air cells. Remember to look for aeration and anomalous vascular structures. We wanna look at the middle ear cavity to look for various mucosal thickening and other lesions that potentially could impede the, the um, course of that cochlear electrode. We looked at the cochlea and specifically looked at inner ear malformations and labyrinthitis ossificans, and specifically look for types of gushers. We want to evaluate to ensure that the cochlear nerve is present, because if the cochlear nerve is absent, that is a true contraindication for performing a cochlear implant. And eventually, we want to also talk about that accessory organ called the brain. So thank you very much for your attention.